to the Bet the Board podcast, powered by FanDuel Sportsbook. It's the Thanksgiving Spectacular, where we run the gamut of the NFL and college football, an annual tradition around these parts. I want to remind all of you, before you get together with your friends and family this holiday weekend, sign up for FanDuel.com slash Bet the Board. Take advantage of your $1,000 risk-free bet, all sorts of enhanced odds. You know you're going to be wagering all weekend long, so you don't have to listen to Aunt Sally talk about how she made the cream spinach. FanDuel's got you covered. Mr. Payne, you got it in the tank to go for Fandle two. has us covered on cream spinach recipes. Is that what you just indicated there? Yeah, cream, cream spinach. I mean, if she's got winners, then you're going to listen to Aunt Sally. If she can dole out college basketball and NFL and <laughs> college football, NHL, I mean, KHL. If she's got winners, you're going to listen from start to finish. Yes, there's no doubt about that. No doubt about that. Sorry, continue on. No, no, I, I, I'm, I'm out of stuff. You're going to fill the airways for the next two and a half hours as we break down five college games and five pro games. It, it, I'm going to tell you, it's not going to be two and a half hours as we sit here <laughs> at 11.30 p.m. Eastern. <laughs> I'm going to be probably asleep halfway through this thing. Well, that's fine. We can uh, ramble on. I can offer up play-by-play at Gonzaga, UCLA. I mean, we can do a number of different unique things uh, around these parts. Um, by the way, uh, you want to fill our listeners in on what that Thanksgiving promotion was? When do I have to share? my favorite side dish was it this podcast is it social media is it monday night i get confused with all the money that you want to give away yes so lots of giveaways going on it is the thanksgiving time of year gonna give the loyal listeners some cash i still don't even know what your favorite thanksgiving dish is so you'll have to inform me but we will let the winner know on the friday pregame show which i believe is the third our next one, we'll let them know there. Hundred bucks cash. So go to the pinned video on YouTube in the comments. Put in Todd's favorite Thanksgiving dish. Hundred bucks cash to the winner. Also Monday, I believe that'll be the 29th. We will have a 400th episode Twitter contest. Four hundred dollars cash. Skill based Monday night game. Washington and Seattle. Follow the rules. You'll see a pinned tweet there. Go up Monday morning. And then of course the Apple podcast giveaway three winners 100 bucks cash each put in your five star reviews leave a nice little comment we'll run an automator and pick three winners those will be announced on the monday podcast as well so lots of cash going out here over 800 bucks i believe if my monkey math serves me there uh no yes yes 800 bucks there we go i'm glad you got your pen and paper your abacus and your calculator there was no pen and paper that was that was half out of it just off the cuff there you go well I, I applaud the efforts and one of these days maybe we get to episode 800 i'll get to actually see this automator that produces all these winners for our loyal listeners but encourage- i gotta tell you gotta tell you i, I think i'll be retiring before that happens <laughs> but just, just gonna throw that out there well that's uh, apparently gonna be the headliner coming out of this podcast it's gonna make national news after all the publications that have talked about bet the board spanning the globe the headline's gonna be pain insider says he will not make it to episode 800 no no i don't think i have another seven years in me but we'll see how things go (laughs) all right let's get into the games and let's get things started we'll go in rotation order we'll start with college we'll get into the pros like we said five college games five pro games all of them as always will be time stamped so if you're in the car you're on a plane listen in fits and spurts to be able to get all the information so egg bowl starkville mississippi it's mississippi state a one and a half point favorite at FanDuel sportsbook total on this game is 62 and a half pain 119th edition of this rivalry it's the first time since 2015 these two programs will play the game where both are actually ranked good chance that the game could be played in cold wet conditions you have to love the fact that Lane Kiffin says people shouldn't hate each other based on schools they attended. I don't think Mississippi State or Ole Miss fans tended to agree with Lane, but it adds a little log on the fire for what should be a great football game. And two quarterbacks that really deserve top billing. I mean, Matt Corral has been one of the headliners throughout the year in the SEC. Falling off as far as his production is concerned, may or may not end up making it all the way out to New York City as a member of the elusive Heisman Club. Probably won't win it. But on the other side, Will Rogers has really caught the sec by storm and a guy that's caught your eye i know you've been high on him and think you know he's gonna have a chance to play on sundays when his time in starkville is completely over yeah listen i I think this game is just one of the more fun rivalries and now that ole miss and mississippi state are trending in the right direction on the field and you also have 
two walking, talking sound bites off the field. This game's kind of electric. I, I'm an NFL guy, but this is probably the game I'm looking most forward to on, on Thanksgiving. On paper, both offenses appear to have edges in the passing game. And you mentioned Will Rogers. That is my guy. I think he is extremely underrated. I think he'll have success throwing short and intermediate here against Ole Miss. And we know what that Rebels defense is. It's usually a drop coverage. It's helped them do a great job limiting the explosive pass. That's why their EPA pass defense looks substantially better than the down-to-down pass defense. But if you do look at that metric, Ole Miss outside the top 75 in passing success rate allowed. So they can be had underneath um, in, in their zones. Will Rogers, if you look at those areas of him throwing the ball short and intermediate windows, 112 passer rating, 22 touchdowns, just a 2% turnover-worthy throw rate. I would expect Will Rogers to have a solid day there looking at this matchup. And that's where he's best. That's where the offense is best. And that's where Ole Miss is weakest. Matt Corral should also have success throwing. All his horses out wide have returned. Drummond, Sanders, Mingo are back. That's obviously vital when your team strength is offense and quarterback. Having weapons like that clearly changed the entire dynamic. What's interesting is Mississippi State has a corner and Martin Emerson that's gotten some first-round draft buzz. But if you look at Mississippi State's secondary overall, they haven't been great outside the top 60 in both passing success rate and EPA per pass allowed. As you alluded to at the top, keep an eye on the weather. There's potential for this to be a little bit wet. I think in general, we're higher on Mississippi State than most. We make them two and a half here. In saying that, it's probably because old Mrs. Sample has had multiple games where, where Drummond, Sanders, and Mingo have all been out. The model shows value to the under, despite the passing advantages that I just outlined. I am not sure I will end up on it. But Thanksgiving week, and this will be something that we reference multiple times, that is the week where the public is out in full force. That is the week where the public has their say in the market so if this got to 65 which is a key number and there is some weather i would probably have to dabble under my understanding though is mississippi state will be the sharp side in this game and i think we'll also see at kick if this were to approach 65 there'll be some value bets under as well you know it's interesting because when you look at old miss early in the year we knew about their pace and tempo this high flying offense and some of the gaudy totals that were out there but you look at how they performed over the last five games in comparison to the market against lsu over under closes at 77 final score 31 17 48 points at all against auburn 67 and a half the closing total 51 total points 67 the total against liberty 41 points 58 against texas a&m 48 points points 64 and a half last week against Vanderbilt 48 five straight games paying all coming under by 10 points or more we'll see uh, how things play out on the field on Thursday night for a lot of the reasons you just outlined in the Egg Bowl a game that should be well worth its weight in gold and one that we can only hope we get an Elijah Moore type moment where a player on either side decides to lift (laughs) his leg cost his team a chance for one of the holy grails in the SEC West all right from Thursday night in Starkville to Saturday Saturday in Ann Arbor, where it's Ohio State and Michigan, essentially a play-in game starting early for these two programs that'll enter the game at 10 and 1. You're looking at Ohio State, an eight and a half point favorite at FanDuel Sportsbook. Total on the game at 64 and a half. The Buckeyes, they've won eight straight meetings, ninth in a row would mark the longest win streak in the series since the turn of the 20th century. Not the 21st, the 20th. Buckeyes have obviously won 15 of 16, but Michigan has been so historically dominant that they still lead the all-time series here. And when you look at Ohio State pain since losing to Oregon. The Buckeyes have rattled off nine wins in a row, seven of them by three touchdowns or more. Much to our chagrin the last two weeks, we didn't lay the points with the Buckeyes. It was a lay it and laugh type scenario. Can this Ohio State offense be stopped by the Michigan defense? Near impossible to shut Ohio State's offense down. So... You know, Michigan's got to be able to run it with Haskins and Edwards and Corum and Cade McNamara. He has to play the game of his life and do things Peyton Thorne couldn't do, and that's extend drives with timely throws and hit a few explosives off the play action. But I think we would certainly be doing this game a disservice if we didn't key in on C.J. Stroud, the way he's playing in the Buckeyes offense, which is just absolutely humming the last two weeks against Aiden Hutchinson and the Wolverines defense that everyone seems to be in love with. Um 
we saw Ohio State make some fundamental changes against Purdue. Right, we outlined that a little bit last week, where C.J. Stroud was getting the ball out of his hands quicker. There was an emphasis on the short pass. Stroud's time to throw was two point one seconds against Purdue. It worked really well, right? I mean, Ohio State just went nuts. Turned out, you know, a positive zero point seven five EPA per play, fifty nine percent success rate. First six drives were all touchdowns. Then against Michigan State. She just tried to throw it as quickly, but he was getting it out faster than his average time this season, and he put up a 74% success rate and a positive 0.75 EPA <laughs> per pass. Now, sure, there's you know been some sports center like explosive deep throws that we've seen, but against Purdue, 71% of Stroud's throws never traveled more than nine yards. 69% against Michigan State. I think Michigan's secondary is better than Sparty's, no doubt. But the metrics don't really depict reality unless you're using schedule-adjusted numbers for Michigan. And if you look at the quarterbacks and passing offenses that Michigan's faced this year, it is just... It's downright brutal. I mean, you're looking at Rutgers. It's Wisconsin, the Big Ten every year, Payne. You talk about this all the time. Yes. Yes, that is, that is true. I mean, you know, maybe sniff the state of Florida and get an athlete here or there. Uh, but, you know, you're, you're looking at, at Rutgers, Northwestern, Wisconsin, and Indiana. All four are outside the top 100 in passing EPA per play a lot, right? Penn State, Washington, and Maryland are outside the top 57 in passing EPA. Maryland being the best of that latter trio. And if you look at trending metrics, Maryland's far worse than 57th with a banged up receiver core. Then you've got Western Michigan and NIU. I mean, uh, Rocky Lombardi already proved he couldn't play at the Big Ten level. The only two offenses Michigan has played that rank inside the top 50 in schedule adjusted EPA per pass are Nebraska and Michigan State. The Wolverines defense gave up 66 points in those two games. And for the last couple years, any time we have seen Michigan step up in class, their corners have not been able to hold up athletically or speed wise. And so that is that's going to be difficult here. There's two other things that are that are interesting about this matchup and, you know, why Sparty was able to throw somewhat well against Michigan's defense is they had the threat of run with Kenneth Walker. And I know he's up for Heisman, but talent wise, I think Travion Henderson is better. Michigan's defensive line, 70th in line yards, 112th in stuff, right? Like all the talk of two potential first round draft picks along the D line. And yeah, Michigan gets bullied at times in the trenches, most often, actually. And Ohio State's offensive line, sixth in line yards, second in stuff rate allowed. So there's an advantage there up front as well. Now, Aiden Hutchinson and David Ajobo can get pressure on your quarterback. They're fantastic, they're likely first round picks. But those two guys are why I specifically mentioned C.J. Stroud getting rid of the ball quicker the last two weeks. It feels like a guy like Ryan Day is cognizant of what is ahead. He's going to be planning, right? And, and so things that he's doing in Purdue are beneficial for down the line when they play Michigan on the road. That's, that's what good coaches do. Ohio State also has two very good tackles in Jones and Petit Ferrer, right? Those two have combined to give up an average of two and a half pressures per game. That's it, about one a man. So if that matchup becomes a stalemate for Hutchinson and Ajobo, then what, right? Like, what does Michigan do defensively at that point? Now, here's kind of the dilemma for me, right? If the game were played on a neutral last week, we have an Ohio State minus seven and a half. That's our number. The line, as we're recording this, just shot up to eight and a half, and it's at Michigan. And the one thing that's likely going to keep me off Michigan, Todd, is, and who knows where this line goes, right? My guess is this might have a chance, just again, based upon this being Thanksgiving week and the public out in full force, there's a chance that this flirts potentially with 10, and it would be tough not to like value bet Michigan at this point. I, I, I I won't be able to do it, but you know, what's going to keep me off is if you kind of go back to what we discussed early in the season, when Ohio state wasn't looking great, I said, listen, right? Like you have a five-star freshman quarterback. What Ohio state is now won't be what they are in a couple months because you have a player in CJ Stroud at the most important position, getting better every week, the level Ohio state can play to improves each week and it feels like you find a new level of peak and so that's what would concern me thinking that there's value in Michigan because CJ Stroud and Ohio State could find another level of peak that is not factored into this number 
Can Michigan do enough to run the ball and play keep away uh, with Hassan Haskins? We know Blake Corum trending up, but still no clear definitive answer if he's going to be available. Does that become Michigan's key to success, just putting together four or five minute drives if they're able to do so and keeping that Buckeyes offense on the sidelines and out of rhythm? That's the hope. Right. But can you do it? Because that's obviously going to be the focus of Ohio State's defense. And they are starting to trend a little bit better in the trenches as well. A lot of young guys, especially at linebacker. We saw that was the way you could beat them early in the season when Minnesota kind of mulled them. And that's got to be the the blueprint for Michigan here. But at well, some point, Cade McNamara, he's going to have to make some throws in the secondary. Oh, right? there's no- And I think you'll know pretty quickly. Right, if they're able to get the ground game going and Cade McNamara is able to, you know, pick up some timely third downs, hit the hit the big explosive off of play action. There's just not a ton of weapons outside for Michigan, right? When Bell went down early in the season, that was one of the things that we outlined. We're like, hey, who, who are the weapons now outside? So if you don't have the outside weapons to threaten deep, because I do think Michigan, uh, I do think Ohio State's still a little bit vulnerable in the back end. Yep. Now all of a sudden you can kind of clog the box. And that changes things, right? The game plan here is going to be make Cade McNamara beat me. With. That's the the idea here, I think, for for Ohio State defensively. And, and I thought they showed pretty well early on in the game when Kenneth Walker was trying to get established. Now, obviously, the the game script negated you know Walker having a huge role because it's blowout city. But I, I think they can probably do enough to negate that. Now, if Michigan comes out and is able to run the ball. Right then it becomes a little bit different of a story. But you're going to need Cade McNamara in this game to do things that Peyton Thorne could not, and that's extend drives because there are going to be that third and four, third and five. And he's going to have to be able to pick those up. And you are at some point going to have to hit an explosive, and I'm not sure Michigan has the guys outside to do that. Yeah, we haven't seen a ton of that. I mean, Cade has been efficient when called upon. We've seen Michigan throw the football a little bit more, but this is a different step up in class. And as we've seen all the time, methodical is great in theory until Ohio State's able to get one stop. Suddenly you're chasing a two-score deficit and you just don't have the horses to keep up with the thoroughbreds there. So we'll see what Michigan can try and put forth here. We know Jim Harbaugh's success is hinged on a ground game in his career at Michigan. 29-0 and when the team runs for 200-plus yards. Not quite sure that's going to be in the car this weekend when they welcome in the scarlet and gray knowing whoever comes out of there victorious will control their own destiny in terms of getting to the college football playoff with the big 10 championship looming most likely against wisconsin from the midwest out to the west coast and the civil war between oregon state and oregon has the ducks a seven and a half point favorite at FanDuel sportsbook total on the game sits at 60 and a half the beavers last win in eugene well it came way back when in 2007 december 1st it was the first bowl game under Jonathan Smith has already been clinched for this Beavers team so clearly progress they're headed in the right direction the Beavers would need Washington to beat Washington State to control their own destiny in the Pac-12 North and when you look at since the Pac-12 divided into the North and South OSU hasn't even had a piece of the conference title since 2000 so that's the one thing that you see running through all of the reading leading up to this game but Payne we've talked about Oregon at great lengths I think rubber finally met the road where they ran into an absolute buzzsaw last weekend against the Utah team that we more or less saw coming at the same time Oregon State the biggest question mark for them defensively do they have enough in the trenches to keep Oregon from establishing the ground game because as the clip you tweeted out and we highlighted Saturday morning if you can make Oregon one-dimensional and take away the run I don't think Anthony Brown and his ability to throw the football scares anyone yeah it's it's wild because I don't think this is going to feel like a Pac-12 game and I think you could say the same thing on both sides of the ball, that it's going to come down to which team cares, which team wants to be there, which team plays more physically. Both teams want to run the ball, right? That's that's their offensive identity. Uh, Anthony Brown, we know, is a game manager. At best, we saw that unfold again uh, against Utah. 74th in EPA per play for Anthony Brown. Chance Nolan has been a pleasant surprise. 32nd EPA per play is kind of been like the the winning lottery ticket for Jonathan Smith. I mean, he was the third quarterback on the depth chart heading into fall camp for Oregon State. So that's that's pretty crazy to see how that's unfolded. And just some of the the quotes that you see out of the team, right? Like they don't necessarily knew they were going to be here, right? This was kind of a little bit of a shock to them that that they're 7 and 4. We did see a motivated Beavers defense shut down a very similar offense last week in Arizona State, right? Big, mulling offensive line, 
a better back than what's on Oregon's roster and Rashad White. Uh, you have a mobile quarterback in Jaden Daniels as well. ASU and Oregon's offense are, are, are kind of similar in makeup, right? And defending that style hasn't been the Beavers' strength defensively. Even with last week's effort, right, against Arizona State, you look at the Beavers' defense still outside the top 80 in line yard stuff rate and opportunity rate. So they have struggled defending the run overall, but it was better last week. So it's good to see that you can defend that style. It should help them prep for this game, but let's see what the Beavers' defense can do. Uh, The Ducks, you mentioned, play a defense that is the complete opposite, right? Like they were mulled in the trenches against Utah. Their front seven was just absolutely dominated. I'm looking at the numbers right now. Utah was a positive 0.42 EPA per rush, over 3.7 line yards. Oregon didn't create havoc with their front seven. Utah was really smart. And I went back and watched this game because I I just wasn't going to watch it in the moment. I decided to get out a little bit. But every single run, it felt like, was away from Kayvon Thibodeau. And that was, you know, really smart by Whittingham. Let's see if Smith kind of follows that up this week. And if you listen to Mario Cristobal and Tim DeRuder this week and their pressers, you kind of kept getting clueless questions from from media members asking like why is Oregon's defense so bad on third downs why couldn't they get off the field on third down and multiple times both coaches were like Utah just lived in short yard situations on third down and that's something we have been talking about forever right like third downs are fluky third downs have a ton of variance early downs are far more predictive and Oregon State's offensive line is number one in the country in line yards, fifth in opportunity rate, third in stuff rate allowed. And that's kind of been the unsung hero to this team. And all signs point to Oregon being bullied in the trenches yet again this week. And, you know, aside from the run games and the offensive lines being kind of the, you know, core makeup of both offenses, why I'm kind of focusing on this is to play a physical brand of football, right? You've got to want to be there. You've got to want to play that style mentally. This is Oregon State Super Bowl, right? They're playing with house money at this point. I understand it's a rivalry game, and you'd hope Oregon gets up for it as well. But a week ago, the Ducks controlled their own destiny and were focused on the college football playoff berth and and a run at the national championship. Now you're back at home playing like little brother in the driveway, right? Like it's, it's possibly a feeling of a team beneath you. And at the same time, Mario Cristobal and his people are picking up their phones anytime they see 305 or 352 on the area code, right? That that's 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 what's going on here. Um I don't know if he's going to make that move to Miami or Florida. We'll see what unfolds. Let's just see if a Pac-12 championship and a Rose Bowl are enough to get the Ducks to care here. Yeah, it may be a tough selling point knowing that Oregon found a way to back into the conference championship last year when Washington had a COVID situation. They end up drumming USC. They go to a bowl game and get drummed themselves by Iowa State. So we'll see if the Rose Bowl is enough of an allure to get in there. And like you say, buckle down, try and handle some of the physicality in the trenches. We know stopping B.J. Baylor won't be easy by any stretch of the imagination. One injury to keep tabs on for Oregon State defensively. They could be down the services of Avery Roberts, the team's leading tackler, had an ankle injury uh, but the one thing Kyrie Fisher stepped in and performed admirably in his absence didn't seem to be a major concern for Oregon State but you would like all hands on deck in a game of this magnitude when you go up against your in-state rival all right Payne, where does from- this line where's this line go I mean, I honestly think there's going to be too much public money that comes in on Oregon that I think this number you're going to get a seven and a half where FanDuel is right now and I think it probably sits there that makes sense I, I we would have made it Oregon minus seven and a half on a neutral last week and it's now seven at home after adjustments in the opposite direction for both teams in general I I mean I like where the Beavers are heading it's just a really well coached team I like Jonathan Smith he really should be in consideration for the Washington job let's see how that unfolds he said all the right things about wanting to build the Beavers up but at the same time he's the lowest paid power five coach in football and the guy that is kind of being rumored to Washington because there is some internal issues at Auburn is Brian Harson. Um, but there is some 
interesting aspects with Brian Harson, and we know that there was a coach fired at Washington State. The program didn't want to let him go. It was a state thing, and so that is the hurdle for all of the Brian Harson talk to Washington. Yeah, the Jonathan Smith story is going to be real interesting because obviously he has loyalty to his alma mater. Um, the Dennis Erickson led, I think it was a Fiesta Bowl or Orange Bowl championship team was honored last week in their win against Arizona State. Uh, it'll be curious to see if boosters can pony up enough to keep him there because like you said, Jonathan Smith was the offensive mastermind for Chris Peterson for a lot of those years in Seattle. Yep. So it ties to that yep. program as well. And from what I've been told, Chris Peterson still has quite a bit of say in terms of what Washington will do and the direction it'll go to name a successor to Jimmy Lake at this point, despite how poorly that uh, last experience went for a season plus, one that I think both you and I saw coming a mile away. A little bit surprising that the program didn't see it in quite such a fashion. So something to watch, especially knowing that Washington has a quarterback of the future in uh, Mr. Heward there poised to take over uh, and really put this program right where they need to be in Seattle. But from one in-state rivalry to another, this time to Bedlam with an awful lot at stake in Stillwater and who knows how much longer these two in-state programs will play one another. If you read Mike Gundy's comments this week, he says, you know, I'm not sure the economics of college football will allow us to continue playing annually when Oklahoma makes the move to the SEC. I don't think that's a veiled shot off the bow. I think it's just a uh, understanding of reality in the world we live in now. Oklahoma State, a four and a half point favorite as they'll welcome in big brother in the Oklahoma Sooners. Total in this game, 49 and a half at FanDuel Sportsbook. And when you look at this series, I think those folks new to college football go, well, this is pretty competitive. If you look at the historical sample size, Oklahoma State has beaten Oklahoma 18 times in the previous 115 meetings. Oklahoma State hasn't won against OU since 2014, but it'll be the second straight year OSU enters as the higher ranked team in the matchup. The winner historically has needed to score 30 points. That's been the magic threshold in each of the last 11 meetings to lay out some of the championship scenarios. Oklahoma State, They've already punched their ticket to the Big 12 championship. Oklahoma needs a win or a Baylor loss uh, to secure a title game rematch against OSU. When you look at the Cowboys, this team has rattled off nine straight covers uh, since early in the year when they were trying to figure out their identity. And you have to give Tay Martin a ton of credit, Payne, spouting off in the wake of their shutout performance against Texas Tech. And I quote, we plan to be whooping that ass. Yeah. We'll see. The yeah. line certainly not quite sure. I want to rattle the cages. Says, not sure. I want to quite rattle the cages of a team that's owned you over the last seven, eight years. We did see this line right before recording move out to Oklahoma State minus four and a half juiced at some of the sharper shops. The first thing I'll say when handicapping this game is regardless of what happens over a, a one game sample in Bedlam we can at least go into the handicap not wondering in the back of our minds if the Sooners are like dead and buried and packing it in, right? Like they still might not be a good team or the team that we hoped coming into the year, but I think we would have known they were dead and buried, right, if they quit last week. And and they didn't quit, right? And, and I think that would have shown against Iowa State in my mind. So we kind of remove that worry from the equation. There's a lot of moving parts in this game. Right, like uh, on paper, we know Oklahoma's secondary has been the weakness outside the top 100 in EPA per pass allowed, barely inside the top 100 in passing success rate allowed. But I think the question is truly this: right, is is Spencer Sanders a consistent enough passer to take full advantage of the Sooners' weakness, and is the Sooners' secondary substantially better in its current form? And when we broke down Oklahoma Baylor. Obviously, Oklahoma lost, but we mentioned the Sooner secondary was getting healthier. DJ Graham, Turner, Yell both returned for the Texas Tech game. That allowed Oklahoma to move Key Lawrence from safety to corner. Woody Washington returned for the Baylor game. And so now all of a sudden, when you return three starters in your secondary and aren't down bodies and playing guys out of position, things look different. Last two weeks, Oklahoma's defense held Brock Purdy to an 83 passer rating, 0.12 EPA per pass, and just a 22% success rate on passing downs. The week prior against Baylor, Sooners defense is what kept them in the game. They were the only chance Oklahoma had. They held Gary Bohannon to a 69 passer rating. Baylor had a negative 0.14 EPA per pass. So I think if you're evaluating or including data pre-Texas Tech to assess the Sooners' secondary. That's probably not the best approach. 
Oklahoma's offense, on the other hand, they're struggling, right? Like, I'm not sure no struggles. Is, I'm not sure struggle is a bit strong enough word, my friend. Yeah, I mean, we hyped up Caleb Williams too soon, right? Obviously, the talent's there, the versatility to run and throw some is is there, but Williams isn't a polished pasture yet. And and the Caleb Williams hype was created by playing defenses like Texas, TCU, Kansas, and Texas Tech. And if you look, the Longhorns are 86th in EPA per play allowed. Texas Tech's 116th, TCU 113th, and Kansas 130th. So that really wasn't the barometer, I think, to gauge Caleb Williams when he stepped up in class against Dave Aranda's Baylor defense and, and even Iowa State's defense. Those are the two toughest he's faced it's been struggle city right couldn't stay on the field last week again a lot of three and outs one for ten on third down now all of a sudden he faces the best defense on the schedule in oklahoma state and the pokes defense is just getting better and better right top five in line yards opportunity rate stuff rate sack rate epa per pass and run allowed this is not going to be your traditional bedlam series that we've grown accustomed to over the years early under money at 52 and 51 and a half hit the market Monday afternoon now down to as low as 49 if the quarterbacks don't turn it over this has all the makings uh, of a grinder here Todd where it's you know first to 24 wins Oh, there, there's no doubt. And I think a lot of people, it'll be a jolt to their system because when you look at it, I mean, these two teams, uh, as you kind of mentioned, not known for their defensive prowess, uh, but Oklahoma State this season has exceeded everyone's expectations. And I have to give uh, one of my friends in the business credit for passing along a nugget uh, who said that Oklahoma State last week in their trip to Lubbock did not have a single defensive starter under the age of 21. So it just speaks to the experience that Jim wow. Knowles has on the defensive side of the ball. It allows them to be versatile. Uh, and they understand their assignments. So we'll see exactly what they can do here. One thing I will say for Oklahoma State, it's been interesting watching their running back by committee over the last couple weeks. Jalen Warren, a bit banged up, only carried the ball 12 times against Texas Tech. Four of his last five games after we thought he was experiencing a breakout earlier in the season, he's gone for less than 80 yards. If Oklahoma is able to take away Oklahoma State's ability to run, to your point, talking about quarterbacks, I'm not sure Mike Gundy has a ton of confidence in Spencer Sanders' ability to go out there and chuck it into the teeth of Alex Grinch's defense from start to finish. Yeah, I would agree with that. I just, I, you know, I think this total comes down to, in the game in general, which of these quarterbacks doesn't make the big mistake? I mean, Caleb Williams probably could have gotten away and hung in that game had he not thrown the whirly derv from his own end zone and, and, and had that ball picked off, right? That was just, it was going to be a grinder. Let's kind of just get through this little lull. So this is going to be an environment that he has not been in yet, right? It's, it's one thing. I understand Baylor had a packed house. It was middle of the day. It's a different thing in a rivalry game at night at Boone Pickens Stadium. So I think this is going to be one of the toughest games in terms of environment that he's seen so far, as a, obviously, as a freshman. So I think you could see a little conservative approach here early, and I think you're going to test the ground game out kind of have this like an old school boxing fight where the first round is is kind of just jab 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 fill out the opponent and and we go from there and Gundy has certainly been a little bit more conservative in the last few years than he was initially the offense has just completely changed and obviously the team's identity is is defense the last few seasons yeah, don't make that big costly mistake and force your team to play from behind in a game of this magnitude where, I mean, these teams are both going to need a little bit of help to get themselves into the college football playoff. But the best thing you can do, finish out the regular season as 12-1 and Big 12 Conference champions. To the Iron Bowl we go, Payne, and this game obviously has lost some of its luster amid Auburn's three-game losing streak as they limp to the finish line. And it's Alabama, nearly a three-touchdown favorite at FanDuel Sportsbook. Total in this game sits at 55 and a half. I do have to give Bo Nix a ton of credit. He was a keyboard warrior, or maybe not quite the right term there, deciding to call out the officiating in the SEC as it pertains to Alabama. Not quite sure he'd have made that move or said those things if he was going to be the starting quarterback this coming Saturday. Uh, Roll and honor that'll be bestowed on TJ Finley. 86th edition of the Iron Bowl. Teams have traded victories over the last five seasons. Auburn's actually won three of the last four. Brian Harsin, of course, his first time coaching in this rivalry. Ranked Alabama team has not lost 
loss to unranked Auburn since 2002 when Alabama came in as a number nine team in the AP poll. When you look at the way these two teams have played down the stretch, Alabama, everything to play for in front of them. Auburn would just love to derail the train. I don't want to oversimplify this handicap, but I guess I have to ask, does Auburn have enough defensively to slow down Bryce Young and this Alabama passing attack that set a program record last week in a 42-35 win against Arkansas? That'll be the question, right? I mean, crazy things happen in the Iron Bowl, especially at Jordan Hare. And, you know, no doubt Auburn's going to come out and fly around early. Alabama clearly has deficiencies in multiple areas, and it just feels like other teams seem to be increasing their level of play. And with every passing week, there's like more questions arising about Alabama. In saying that, the, the line says Alabama absolutely rolls. I mean, Georgia was only laying 14 and a half here, and I get it. Bo Nix was the starter, but it's it's the same Bo Nix that Brian Harson benched at one point, and every Auburn fan has probably cursed multiple times over the last three years. So the, the line is is a little inflated here. When I look at this on paper, Bama has the advantage passing on both sides of the ball. And, and obviously in 2021, when passing equates to winning at large multiples, it's pretty important to mention that. TJ Finley <laughs> is going to be interesting in this matchup. I, I you know, I don't really like him, obviously. He had to transfer out of LSU for a reason. He's not a power five starting quarterback in, in my mind. And, you know, you think about last week. To me, that was a pretty ugly scene against South Carolina. And, and you know... Mike Bobo, Auburn's offensive coordinator, spent a ton of time in prep in game planning to put Finley in the best position possible, knowing that South Carolina fired his boss and then moved on from him after the season. And yet, Finley was was dreadful, right? I mean, 29% depth adjusted accuracy, 34% passing success rate, almost 35% of Finley's pass attempts were either interceptable or uncatchable last week. He has got to be better. I'm not sure he's capable of it. And, and listen, Bama's secondary is vulnerable right now. Like A.J. Jefferson, who really can't throw consistently and only targets one guy, has like the best passing game of his career when considering opponent and venue, right? Like 158 passer rating last week when kept clean for K.J. Jefferson. 82% adjusted accuracy. Three touchdowns, not a single turnover-worthy throw. I'm not sure T.J. Finley has that in him. And if he can't pass well enough, then suddenly Bama can kind of focus on stopping Bigsby and Hunter. And kind of your your question at the top there, it's like, I don't know if Auburn's defense can, can continue to like grind out this game, right? Like Auburn's defense, 85th in EPA per pass allowed. Alabama's third in EPA per pass with Bryce Young, who's just on absolute fire at this point, he hasn't shown any holes in his game. He can throw accurately to all parts of the field. And for a young quarterback, he's handled pressure extremely well. He's handled the blitz very well. He takes care of the football, just a 1.6% turnover-worthy throw rate. Auburn needs something early in this game to keep the emotions running high. It just feels like if TJ Finley can't be a semi-competent passer, eventually Auburn's defense just kind of wears down and breaks. And ultimately, that'll be the key here. Like, we know Auburn's defense is the best part of Auburn. It just feels like eventually, right, like how many three and outs can the offense have for Auburn before the defense just kind of cracks? And so that'll be key. You're going to need an early turnover. You're going to, you know, maybe a special teams touchdown, maybe a, a short field blunder that's set up by by Alabama. You know, again, this number is a touch high. We made it more like 17 and a half, right? There, there's not a ton of difference between that and 19, right? It's it's not investable. It just, it feels like a stay away game. And, and to your point, it has lost some luster. Now, if somehow Bigsby and Hunter go out there and Auburn's offensive line is able to, to win at the point of attack, and you get Finley's legs going a little bit, maybe you can hang in this game if the defense shows out. But I just, I, I think eventually, right, like the three and outs are going to catch up to Auburn's defense and they're just going to wear down at some point. 
You know, for all the credit that I gave Derek Mason early in the year, I mean, Auburn had been one of the best teams in terms of making adjustments after the half and trying to adjust some of their coverage schemes and such. They've really cratered in recent games. I mean, last week in South Carolina, they built a 14 nothing lead and weren't able to do much offensively. And to your point, the defense just wasn't able to withstand the barrage. What was interesting in the wake of that loss against the Gamecocks, Shane Beamer comes out in the postgame comments and says, we talked about this being big boy SEC football. We literally lined up in the second half and ran the same two plays over and over and over again and Auburn did not have answers I'm not sure that will be lost on Alabama as they look to secure passage which they already have to the SEC championship but more importantly for the Crimson Tide to keep themselves very much in the discussion for the college football playoff perfect time Shane's making some noise by the way who is Shane's been Shane's been doing that it's going to be interesting to see how that works at South Carolina oh he's poking the bear there's a lot of yeah, a lot of kids like that honesty. And, I mean, you, you go back to the drubbing they took against Georgia, and after the game you had that reporter ask him, like, what was the difference? He's like, dude, like nothing but five-star kids over there. What did you want us to do? <laughs> He's been very vocal. He's been very honest. There are some players in that area. I, I think he's a far better recruiter than some of the guys that they've had there recently. It'll be interesting to see how that unfolds at South Carolina. But it feels like there's there's some hope there at least. Uh, he was extremely emotional. I'll say that when uh, they were able to secure the sixth victory of the season and said that he didn't want the yep. season to be over in a week and a half. And again, that level of emotion, I don't think is lost on 18 and 19 year old men trying to figure out who they're going to play for. If their coach is going to go to battle for them and on their behalf, you can follow pain. When you're building a program, right? Like the, that extra 21 practices or how many ever practices oh, it goes a, it is a long way the game. It's huge. I mean, it's exactly what you're rooting for to unfold in Gainesville over the weekend. Oof. Tough game, tough game, <laughs> tough game. Line, line certainly said Florida State has a chance. We've seen some early money come in on Florida. Have to monitor the status of a few key cogs up front for Florida State. But certainly the vibe within the programs are a little different this week for sure. I know you'll feel a lot better if this game happens to close at Pickham on Saturday before they kick things oh. off at Ben Griffin Stadium in <laughs> yes. the swamp. Yes. You can follow Payne on Twitter at Payne Insider. I'm Todd Furman. You, of course, can follow me there as well. Most importantly, follow the podcast at Bet the Board Pod and go to fanduel.com slash bet the board. Take advantage of all of the great promotions, new user signups in all of the states where FanDuel is available to you. From the college gridiron pain to the National Football League, and no, we will not be breaking down Bears and Lions. Sorry, beloved Bears fans that are out there hoping that we could cast aspersions on Andy Dalton and potentially the last game of Matt Nagy's tenure uh, out there on the lake. There'll be no breakdown of the Dallas Cowboys and the Las Vegas Raiders, so we may as well start with the Thursday night nightcap, and that will pit the Buffalo Bills against the New Orleans Saints. The Bills have been bet up from where they open in that 4-4.5 four, four range, now six-point favorites at FanDuel Sports sportsbook total on the game 45 and a half a matchup of supposed top six defenses pain but two units that have shown quite a bit of vulnerability over the last couple of weeks the bills they've been road warriors 15 and 6 on the highway the last 21 games the saints a very difficult out in their own building 31 and 11 the last 42 home games and we've rattled off the stats sean payton when catching points always attempting proposition you wouldn't have known it last week though when they were boat raced by the philadelphia eagles and i guess the simplest and most straightforward forward question to ask can the bills right the wrongs in their passing game against the new orleans secondary that's been ripe for the picking in recent weeks yeah it's certainly a struggling bills offense against a regressing saints defense and that is certainly the the key focal point and i think for all the talk about mahomes and andy Reid and the chiefs offense struggling The Bills offense has regressed substantially more and done so against one of the three easiest schedules of defenses in the NFL. And it just feels like defenses have adapted and changed how they defend these passing offenses. And now we're in that transition period where the offenses have to counter the adjustment. And it it takes time. And it's not just coming up with the way to counter it, but getting comfortable and executing that counterattack. And so we're seeing a lot of these high-flying offenses really have to change some things up but what i am seeing specifically from buffalo's offense is this right more running 
which is fine if that's the look you're being given, right? I mean, even in the loss to Indy last week, the Bills had a 69% rushing success rate, but ultimately passing is far more efficient. The second thing is Josh Allen's obviously come back down to earth, and it's not just the throwing, it's it's the reading defenses, it's being comfortable. Brian Dable's got to get the ball out of Josh Allen's hands quicker, right? Trust the play, trust the read, get the ball out on time and let the receivers work. There's too much hero ball from Josh Allen going on right now. The other issue is the Bills didn't address their offensive line in the offseason, something we've mentioned a couple times throughout the course of of our breakdowns. It was an average O-line to begin with, and now you have two starters out. John Feliciano is the man responsible for getting the offensive line set up. He's responsible for identifying blitzes, and right tackle Spencer Brown is out as well. In saying that, there are still some clear edges here, right? Like there is really a definable way to attack the Saints defense right and it's it's QB and wide receiver runs they've been very productive against the Saints the Saints are extremely sensitive to play action passes the most sensitive actually you can throw on them from heavier sets we know there's a massive void at corner opposite Marshawn Lattimore a guy like Emmanuel Sanders knows the Saints defense inside now having spent last year in New Orleans but really why this game has moved a bunch aside from a group earlier today laying four on Buffalo are the injuries, most of which are on the Saints offensive side. Kamara trending towards being out again. Right tackle, Ryan Ramchek looks like he's out. We already know that starting guard Andres Pete has been out. Taron Armstead has been out multiple weeks. He's only getting in limiteds on a Monday and Tuesday, and Monday was more of an estimation. They didn't actually practice. The third string tackle that started last week at Philadelphia got injured and's out for the year. That's not a great situation when you're going against a Bills defense that's number one in pressure rate. You already have a backup quarterback in Trevor Simeon who will likely be under pressure here. And Adam Troutman, his security blanket with 27 targets the last four games, is also out. I think it's possible, knowing what week it is, right? Knowing the Bills took early sharp money and the public will certainly be piling on as well, that this line is going to get to seven. The question becomes, is that the number to get a few respected betters or a group to bite at the key number? And I am not sure of that, but obviously, right, we have a Bills team that has not looked great in recent times, losing on the road to Jacksonville, getting pummeled last week to the Colts, and they are currently laying a number that was far substantial or substantially higher, rather, than what Tampa laid here a month ago. That's what I was going to say. And You're, so suddenly we're paying a premium point, to like, bet against the Saints. Yeah. It, now, again, right, they are just decimated by injuries on the offensive side of the ball. And so that, that becomes a question like Mark Ingram as well has not practiced yet this week. So, you know, it's Trevor Simeon behind a makeshift offensive line without his best running backs. And, you know, it just becomes a difficult task to kind of navigate here and Leslie Frazier and those guys are chomping at the bit after getting beat up last week and you know it's partly Leslie Frazier's fault like I was looking at some of the numbers and like they didn't load the box at all they just said hey we're going to be this too high defense that we are and we're not going to adjust to Jonathan Taylor just going absolutely ham on the ground I believe I saw less than a five percent rate of eight plus men in the box Jonathan Taylor faced last week so at some point you have to adjust but I, I guess the point here is you can get pressure on Trevor Simeon with potentially three offensive linemen down let's monitor the Taron Armstead situation he's the likeliest of the three linemen to go but can you run the ball right can you keep this game in a neutral script and and that ultimately becomes the question because if you can run the ball and keep it in a neutral script then all of a sudden you might be able to run the ball you know on Leslie Frazier's defense but God forbid Buffalo's offense builds a lead here and you're trying to pass protect Trevor Simeon with no weapons and and both the tackles out and and Buffalo's great getting pressure this game becomes a little bit ugly and snowballs and and you can see why the four and four and a half were late earlier today you mentioned the Jonathan Taylor situation and the last thing I want to ask you about in this game how worried should we be though about a Buffalo defense that was on the field for nearly 38 minutes turning around in 72 hours to play in hostile territory which could be and has been historically a very electric atmosphere that I sure I'm sure will be juiced up with Drew Brees being inducted into the ring of honor or whatever the hell they call it down there yeah 
<laughs> listen, it's it's historically been one of the better home field advantages. Now it's was really good after you know the tragedy that struck down there and when the Saints were good and in general like home field advantage is better when teams are better. Yep. But yeah, that is that is a concern, right? On the field for for 38 minutes and now it's a short week and you're you're traveling for for a game like this and that is an environment that's that's probably going to be electric. Um I don't know the answer to that. I, I think ultimately the market's speaking, right? And the guys who are the sharpest are speaking. And they're saying the injuries on offense to the Saints are far more substantial than spending an extra eight minutes on the field. Um, now, again, at some point, price matters. And we're already at six and a half. Like, I don't I don't know what that price looks like, right? It's Thursday night. Everyone's going to be at home. Does this get to seven easily? Does it, does it, get, does it exceed seven, right? I, I, I don't I don't know the, the answer to that because we have just seen wild line moves Thanksgiving week. Yeah. And no. so, uh, yeah, I just, you know, at seven, like, the, the number's a little nutty. It, at seven and a half, the number's even nuttier. You know, it, I, I just, I don't know where it's going to stop. It's definitely one of those things that anticipating market movement this time of week gets to be much more challenging than what we've grown accustomed to throughout the course of well, the middle I'm, of the season. We're, we're, yeah, and everything we're else good that doing that. Like, you know, I could, I could probably tell you where every single line on the board is going to move just about every single week. But this week is just like if you like dogs, right, and, and they're not the public dogs, right, like you, you can sit back and, and wait this week, right, especially when you look at some of the time slots. Right, that that bailout game on Saturday night, the bailout game on on Thursday night. Like, if you're looking for the dog, right, and it's it's not the public side, typically you can wait, even if you've missed the number because a group got happy early in the week and took it. Like, it will typically come back this week. That's just kind of what we've seen with with history on Thanksgiving week. Uh, there's a number of contests that that will apply to, and we'll see if this one has similar line movement as well, because clearly a team trending in the right direction over the last couple of weeks, Payne, has been the New England Patriots. And we see them nearly a full touchdown favorite, minus six right now at FanDuel Sportsbook. Total on the game sits at 44 and a half as they'll welcome in the Tennessee Titans. The Titans, of course, were humbled last weekend, losing outright as a double-digit favorite against the Houston Texans, although for the first time in recent weeks, it was the Titans on the wrong side uh, of the result, despite dominating on the box score other than in the turnover department. When you look at the Titans, they've gone through a little bit of shuffling on their roster, upgrading Dalton Hilliard from the practice squad after his eight reception performance last week and waving the ageless wonder Adrian Peterson, who might finally be at the end of his rope before also placing Marquez Johnson on injured reserve for a de- receiving core that was already depleted and we're going to have to keep tabs on A.J. Brown's availability. But when you look at these two teams, and we've talked at great lengths that Tennessee wasn't nearly as good as their win-loss record indicated, but is the market finally caught up to New England or are they still a step behind when you look at how well Mac Jones has played, you look at the two-headed monster emerging in the backfield from Andre Stevenson and Damian Harris and a defense rapidly improving as well as we've seen their ability to generate pressure in recent weeks. The reason I really like doing this podcast is <laughs> being able to to come on here and tell people what's really going on with teams. And well, like ninety nine point nine percent of sports talk radio is anointing the Titans a Super Bowl contender. We've been pretty adamant that Tennessee is a paper tiger. In their defense, a lot of that is is injury related. And yes, obviously, all NFL teams have injuries, but the Titans' injuries impact the style in which they can play right the other teams have injuries but they're still kind of doing what they do and uh, the titans can't really play that way with some of the injuries that they've had right like defenses are playing with less guys in the box and not respecting the titans run game as much that is very clear right like 37 percent of derrick henry's carries this season had eight or more guys in the box adrian peterson who was just cut Jeremy McNichols and Deontay Foreman aren't commanding that level of respect. It's created a situation where there's more guys in coverage for Ryan Tannehill when he's throwing. Julio Jones is on IR. A.J. Brown, as you mentioned, is dinged up. Uh, rib injury against the Texans left that game. Belichick with extra time to prepare for an offense with potentially one weapon and a quarterback he's faced many times in Ryan Tannehill. That's advantage Belichick. 
offensively for New England, O-line is back intact. That's been the huge key, right? Like the penciled in opening day starters have all returned. They're getting a ton of push up front the last few weeks. And now you get a Titans defense that's 22nd in EPA per rush allowed on early downs the first three quarters. If the game is played in a neutral state or the Patriots lead, suddenly the best part of the Titans defense gets negated a bit as well. And that's the pressure they create naturally, especially in the middle of the defensive line. Titans have done a really, really good job pressuring without blitzing. And that's helped the vulnerable secondary. And that's been also banged up. But if opposing offenses aren't throwing in known passing situations because the game script negates that strength or they are able to run the ball very well and set up short yarded situations on third down that pass rush is void a little bit mac jones has done a fantastic job stepping up his game he's made some really really timely throws during this five game stretch if you look over this this recent this recent win streak here of five games early downs first three quarters mac jones has the ninth best passing success rate the first six weeks he was 16th, and the schedule was slightly less challenging the first six weeks. So we're seeing progression against a tougher schedule, and that's just obvious, right? Like Mac Jones has improved. We're, we're watching it in front of our eyes. He's getting used to the system. He's getting used to his players. Like he has been damn good. Injuries, style of play, extra time for Belichick, two teams trending in opposite directions, and that's why you saw an opener of New England minus five and a half, which signals New England's the side. And pro bettors have gotten out early and laid it to where we see a consensus six and a half as we record. We're now at the point where the core number doesn't show any value. So you have to find something informationally or matchup wise to enter at this point, in my opinion. But it's certainly the line is is quite telling. It's painting quite quite the picture here. Now, before we started recording, Todd, last week was kind of the opposite for the Titans, where you know the reason we weren't a fan of Tennessee was obviously the injuries, but games where you go on the road and beat the Rams outright, you know, with 192 yards of offense, we we know that isn't sustainable. Then all of a sudden, kind of last week, you know, they outgained the Texans by 300 yards and, and, and lose. So, <laughs> it, you know, it's it's one of those interesting things here where I, I, I get the vibe that if this were to get to seven and A.J. Brown was upgraded, you could just see some numbers guys come in here and, and, and value bet the Titans at that point. But But certainly all signs, whether it was the opening number, or whether it was the group that I saw come in and lay five and a half this morning, the sharp side to this point is certainly New England. I think it will continue to be, but you will eventually, I think, just get like number grabbers saying, hey, like, you know, I'm just going to value bet seven. It's just way too much um, later on in the week. Mac Jones, in your opinion, rookie of the year ahead of Jamar Chase, given what he's done in recent weeks and how this Patriots team is very much in the thick of things, not just for a playoff berth in the AFC as things stand now, uh, but uh, in the contention to try and knock the Bills from the perch atop the division. Although when you look at New England's schedule, the next three or four weeks will obviously be a heck of a lot more telling than what we've seen thus far. Yeah, I do. I mean, I think he plays the most important position. And, you know, you started getting to some of the narrative stuff too, right? Like, I mean, following Tom Brady's footsteps, that is, that's not an easy thing. And doing it with his receiving core, not an easy thing. And so you play the most important position. I think it's got to be his to lose at this point. Obviously, Jamar Chase has been fantastic, just absolutely ridiculous. He has provided that offense some electricity, which it needs. And, you know, I don't necessarily think the offense is operating optimally in Cincinnati with Zach Taylor. And so him doing these things, despite the offense not being the best run, is, is certainly impressive. And he's going to break a ton of records. But I just think when you when you come into things right and you have a quarterback like Max Jones, who has been battling right throughout camp, right, he's, he's fighting for his job. He wins it. Then all of a sudden we're seeing like this maturation and he continues to get better despite the receiving court not being great. How dare you, you talk poorly of Kendrick Bourne and Nelson Aguilar? How dare you? Yeah. <laughs> you forgot their best guy there. But I think what's also interesting and how I would be if I were a voter 
it's super impressive what Jamar Chase is doing. But there's also guys on that offense that are taking focus away from him, right? Like, suddenly we want to double Jamar. Well, it's like, okay, like T. Higgins, Boyd, and Mixon are just going to kill you. (laughs) And you also have a really good quarterback. Yes, Mixon, man, he's better than I thought he was. The other interesting component here, and I would deduct, and I know it's going to sound crazy, I would deduct, right? Like, when you step into a situation as a rookie, you're like, shit, I'm learning this brand new system. I'm trying to, like, get on the same page as my quarterback. It's like, no, that was kind of the built-in advantage of him and Burrow being, like, best of friends on and off the field, and, right? I, I would I would deduct for that if I were a voter. That's just kind of how my my brain operates no it makes sense for sure and while we look at the Patriots it's seven and four outscoring their opponents 70 to seven the last two weeks not only will they get Tennessee this week they'll go to Buffalo on a Monday night football game which will be outstanding in two weeks they get a bye week they come out of that bye they'll go to Indy and take on Buffalo so the next four weeks will clearly define what the Patriots ceiling can be as far as the regular season is concerned but speaking of those Indianapolis Colts they'll welcome in the Tampa Bay Buccaneers the Bucks three point road favorites at FanDuel Sportsbook total on this game paying 51 and a half if you believe Bruce Arians in the wake of their dominant performance against the New York Giants says it was more precautionary than anything else to hold Vita Vey out of that game he should be a full go this coming weekend Scotty Miller activated off IR giving the Bucks another weapon in that receiving group and a speedster that they so desperately have lacked the one big injury though to come out of that Giants effort though was Ali Marpet uh, with an oblique strain but he immediately ruled out so you do wonder about his availability uh, this coming week. And to your point, to reference a tweet, you could see the emotion in Tom Brady. That's me paraphrasing, but I did like how you put it in context, saying when Tom Brady went for the run, he was breaking up the double play against that New York Yankees defensive sorts. (laughs) He uh, got on the reporter, too. Did you see that? A reporter said... That was a great 10-yard run, and his response was... It was 11. It was 11 yards, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, the biggest factor in this matchup for me is is just class, right? Like, we're looking at a Colts defense right now that's ninth in overall efficiency, but they've played a schedule of bottom feeder offenses, right? 25th in overall strength of schedule, and some of those offenses weren't even operating at peak when the Colts played them. I mean, the Dolphins with Jacoby Brissett and not Tua, the 49ers in a monsoon, the Texans with a third-round rookie starting and not Tyrod Taylor. So even within that bottom feeder list of opponents, like some of those opponents are even weaker than they currently are. This is Tom Brady. This is the most efficient offense in the NFL. And and that offense has been tested. The Bucs have faced the top 10 schedule of defenses. They get a perfect environment indoors on a fast track. The weakness of the Colts defense is their secondary. 20th in overall efficiency. 22nd in EPA per pass allowed. 86% of the touchdowns the Colts have given up are through the air. Most in the league. 79% of the touchdowns Tampa has scored have been through the air. Uh Gronk returned on Monday night. Godwin looked substantially healthier. Scotty Miller, as you mentioned, was activated from IR. There's an outside shot. Maybe we see AB. It's just tough for me to envision an extremely vanilla Colts defense, especially in its coverages, without two starting safeties. And Darius Leonard playing at 70% is going to provide much resistance here. The Colts don't get pressure. They don't blitz. 30th in pressure rate, 25th in pass rush win rate, second lowest blitz rate. It's just going to be tough beating Tom without pressure and soft coverage. It's not the mix, right? And I think that success likely forces the Colts to be a little bit more pass happy. I know the Bucks run defense hasn't been as good as it has been the last two seasons, but it's still solid. Vita Vey, we thought would be out for this, but somehow a three-week injury might just be two weeks. Bruce Arians sounded like Vey is healing a little bit quicker than anticipated. Let's monitor that situation, but it sounds like it's progressing well for the Bucks. Buccaneers defense has also faced an extremely soft schedule of offense, a sixth easiest. So another step up in class for the defense. Buccaneers are healthier in the secondary, but they've still been pretty vulnerable defending some heavy personnel throws, especially from 13 and 12 formations. You start to really analyze the Colts. They're an over team by our metrics. I think they're an over team from a lot of the, the sharp betters, right? The only games that have stayed under in the last eight weeks are ones where the Colts are facing completely inept offenses and Frank Reich turns to like this low variance ground game, especially once they've built the lead, right? Like aside from the Texans and Jaguars games, six of the eight games have gone over recently. You have two offenses that produce first downs 
on first down at a top three rate in the league. It just it doesn't surprise me one bit to see over 51 come in from pro betters uh, today. Very key number when it comes to totals now out to 52, Todd. Yeah, that we have seen a little bit of over money, and that was even in the wake of that defensive performance that we saw from Tampa, who kind of clamped down against the Giants. Really only gave up three points uh, as the Giants' touchdown pass to Andrew Thomas came, of course, after an Adoree Jackson interception that was presented as miscommunication, more or less, between a couple of Bucks receivers. So it should be one of the better games to watch on Sunday with a Colts team trending in the right direction and a Bucks side that we've seen this time of year with Tom Brady at the helm, whether it's in Tampa or New England, typically tends to play its best football as the stakes get ratcheted up and the reason that campaign will take on such added importance for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers is because what we're going to see unfold at Lambeau Field uh, where the Rams will go on the road fresh off a bye to take on the Green Bay Packers. By the way I'm going to interrupt you. Sure. I'm going to interrupt you. That was very bad of me. You, You saw who's going to be calling plays for the Giants this week after the Clapper was fired. Oh, I did. And uh, I wasn't sure how to integrate it in here, but it was a man whose praises you sung that he was much better as a soldier than he would be as a general. We saw him disappoint as a head coach, but as an offensive mastermind, you can say that's arguably when Baker Mayfield was at his absolute best under Freddie Kitchen's leadership. Freddie is back in the play calling kitchen. That is that is what's going to happen this weekend. Let's see what unfolds. He, he, He I'm hoping. Great guy. Let's see if he can get it figured out. But yes, he is he is definitely uh, better served in this role. Hopefully he, he makes the most of the opportunity. That is that's interesting. I it doesn't shock me. Daniel Jones is just regressed. I, I wasn't really sure why they hired Jason Garrett, but let but let's see if they get things turned around here on a short week. I think they're certainly some ways to attack Philadelphia's defense. Carry on. They I, are just, def- I wasn't sure if you saw that or nope, not. Nope, they are definitely healthier as far as the weapons are concerned. Saquon Barkley, though, doesn't look anything close to being 100%, so you wonder if he's ever going to be able to get that burst back. I mean, I was stunned that they only carried it, let, or excuse me, let him carry it six times in the loss against Tampa, albeit game situation dictated a lot of that. But to Lambeau Field, the Green Bay Packers, the scene of the crime where the Rams had their season ended last year in a 32-18 defeat at the hand of Green Bay. It's the Packers, a one-point favorite at FanDuel Sportsbook. Total in this game, pain 47 and a half. Green Bay, 20 and 3 straight up the last 23 games at home. The Rams have now failed to cover in four straight games. Why do I bring that up? Because they're 4 and 6 against the spread. If you blindly bet the Rams this season, well, you'd better be better off lighting that money on fire and betting the Lions, who are 6 and 4 against the number. I did find some of Sean McVay's comments and quotes rather interesting, talking about league-wide parity, saying that's what makes the NFL exciting, but it's also what makes it that much more important to be urgent in every single day, the way we approach our process, our rhythm, our routine. And with the Arizona Cardinals creating a little bit of separation in the division, you can understand the emphasis placed on this particular trip. But for the Green Bay Packers, life won't get any easier pain as the injuries continue to mount on that offensive line. Yeah, there's a couple interesting matchups in this game, but I think you hit it perfectly, right? Like the overarching factors that have caused the market to react both side and total is injuries, right? So so the total dips from 50 to 48 and then the side from Packers minus two and a half to pick. And that's mostly because within the last 48 hours, we find out Elkenden Jenkins tore his ACL and he is far and away the best Packers offensive lineman. He slid to left tackle while David Bakhtiari's been out. Bakhtiari still hasn't returned, so now you're down your top two offensive linemen. At the same time, Aaron Rodgers comes out and says his toe injury is, and I quote, very, very painful, worse than turf toe. Well, and did, that did is you why. hear some of the uh, what he said it was? He explained it. I think it was on Pat McAfee's show, and he got into exactly what's wrong with his foot, which I found rather interesting. I did not tune into the Pat McAfee show. So he was talking about his pinky toe and it's something bone related that he's going to have to play through. So, I mean, if I'm a Rams defender, I'm looking around for Aaron Rodgers foot and I'm trying to do whatever I can to stomp on that thing. There you go. The the, the pinky toe. So it's not the captain. <laughs> I was going to, I, I tried to set it up perfectly for you. And at least I know after 398 episodes, you were going to take it where I led you. <laughs> So, you know, he's been obviously missing some practice the last two weeks. But I'm looking at this. After Jenkins and Bakhtiari, there isn't a lineman on the Packers that's graded out inside the top 90 offensive linemen in the league. And now you get a Rams defense off the bye, able to incorporate Von Miller a little bit more. 
and the Rams are already second in pass rush win rate. All signs point to Floyd clearing concussion protocol as well. And then on the flip side, let's see what Sean McVay comes up with out of the bye. I, I, I've been speaking with some people, and we think it's possible we see Stafford back under center a little bit more. McVay was allowing Stafford to operate from shotgun more than he did golf. But it would make sense now that he's a bit healthier to put him under center. It's it's difficult to play three and five wide, you know, spread sets if you don't have Robert Woods out there like roaming the middle and being the elite blocker on receiver screens. I think it's possible we see more of the old McVay offense, but but let's see what comes of it. I think in that situation, right, we'll see more OBJ this week. His role can only expand off the bye, but I still don't think he's going to have a full menu, right, which is the other reason for this total dropping. If OBJ doesn't have the full menu and the menu he does have requires the Rams to huddle, it means slower tempo. And if you paid close attention against the 49ers, the Rams offense had to huddle when Beckham played because he didn't know the offense well enough to have the plays called at the line of scrimmage. Just write so it on his hand Rams. like just write it on his hand like old school <laughs> Tecmo Bowl. You get four plays, two runs, two passes, go. <laughs> so when when the Rams kind of fell behind and, and forced Beckham out of the game, that's that's what happened, right? That's when they went tempo to play catch up. Beckham couldn't be in the game. I do think we'll see a heavy dose of Henderson, right? Whether the Rams line up an eleven or twelve formation, right? Packers defense over fifty eight percent of runs have graded successful from those two formations. Packers defense in its current form, we think is overachieved some. And and even in saying that, <laughs> right, Green Bay's 26th in defensive rush efficiency and 27th in EPA per rush allowed. So they they were saying, hey, they've overachieved, but they're still not really good in, in those areas. You would think, right, an L.A. team could struggle in cold weather at Lambeau. But the Rams have made this trip just last year in the playoffs. Revenge is on their mind. They now have a cold weather quarterback in Stafford, not a California cool, small handed golf. I think we see the Rams close a favorite here, Todd. Would not shock me at all. The one thing I will say, and we talked off air, when it comes to fading Green Bay at Lambeau Field, it has not been a profitable strategy for me in the past. Uh, We'll see if that potentially changes this week and if I decide to find myself onto this Rams bandwagon of sorts. It is fascinating, though, when you look at where Green Bay closed against a Seattle team that we know is a shell of itself as a modest three-point favorite. They went out there. They took care of business in a 17-0 ho-hum fashion. One last thing. Suddenly the line makes sense, right? Oh, there's, there's no doubt about it. I mean, if you use those two data points as a comparison, uh, there's no doubt about it. One thing, though, I did want to ask about in terms of Green Bay's defense. Did we finally get the regression in just 60 minutes that we've been waiting for yeah. all season last weekend against Minnesota? Yeah, right. And I'd kind of you can only play who's in front of you. Right. And But there were. If you look at it on paper, and I think I said this last week, I'm not quite sure. If you look at it on paper, you're like, oh, my God. Arizona's offense, right? Reed and Mahomes, uh, you know, we've shut down all of these like high powered attacks, but there was some noise there, right? It's like Thursday night game. We got the backyard version, backyard offense version of Arizona without Hopkins, who was like hobbled. He was in and out of the lineup. And that's like, you could probably say within the Mahomes and Reed era, they were at their lowest point ever when the Packers faced them. And so there was some kind of noise if you, you dig into some of the numbers. But listen, like they've overachieved, but they're still playing good ball. Eventually, Jair Alexander will return and the defense will get a little bit healthier. And again, it's, it, you know, we want to put this in like the right context, right? This, relatively speaking, when you have LaFleur and Aaron Rodgers and those offensive weapons, like just being average is all you need from your defense. And there are signs pointing to when Green Bay gets healthier that that could be a thing. Just right now, I there's some underlying metrics that would insinuate that there was going to be regression. and We saw that unfold last week. Well, there's no doubt about it. I think Justin Jefferson is still running against that secondary, but to Green Bay's credit, Marquez Valdez-Scantling did plenty of damage on his own and how differently that game could have ended if Darnell Savage's interception of Kirk Cousins actually stood instead of being overturned out there. All right, Payne, one final game to go in the National Football League, and that is the Sunday Nighter, a showdown in the AFC North, where the Cleveland Browns go on the road into Baltimore with the Ravens, a three-and-a-half-point favorite 
at FanDuel Sportsbook. Total in this game sits at 46. The Ravens won their fifth game last Sunday when trailing in the fourth quarter. They continue to show resilience despite being down key cogs. Uh, I have to give Tyler Huntley a ton of credit, and he probably would have been one of the guys that we highlighted for a good performance on if we did our normal Monday podcast. Not because of what he did from a statistical standpoint, but leading his team back in the final minute and 50 seconds, albeit coming with some broken coverages uh, on behalf of that Bears secondary. But this is a Ravens team who typically when they step up in class performs very well. We know they've covered three straight and seven of the last 10 against the Cleveland Browns, but we did see glimpses of what this Browns offense can be with Nick Chubb. Baker Mayfield continues to be banged up, but those guys are going up against the Ravens defense prone to giving up the big play. These are two teams that I haven't quite been able to wrap my head around and figuring out when they're going to be at the best or when they're going to struggle. I'm hoping you can add a little bit of clarity here in terms of figuring out if the Browns offense has success against the Ravens defense we're assuming we get Lamar back in the fold that Baltimore will be able to do some things against the Cleveland defensive front it'll be interesting to see which unit can can kind of get back on track right like the Browns offense has struggled five of the last six weeks you had the outburst at Cincinnati but aside from that it's been a struggle we know injuries are a big reason for that right like Baker's got the shoulder and the foot and you know Conklin's been out and the running backs have been in and out of the lineup and the receivers are banged up. DPJ couldn't go again last week. But if you look since week six, the Browns have dipped to ninth in EPA per rush and 23rd in passing EPA. Defensively for the Ravens, you would hardly recognize this unit. If the season were to end today, it'd be the worst Ravens defense since 1996 in overall efficiency. And I look at this and it's like who can rebound and I do see some matchup advantages for the Browns offense Chubb and Hunt are back like you mentioned I do think Donovan Peoples-Jones could trend up if you look at Baltimore's defense they've given up 5.2 a carry from three wide sets and a 52 percent success rate on runs from two tight end sets so they have struggled to stop the run a little bit the Ravens have been really sensitive to play action, especially the last two weeks. Two and Dalton look great when throwing with play action. We know that's a staple of the Browns offense. If you look how the Ravens defend tight ends, bottom 10 in the league in both counting stats like receptions and yards allowed, even worse in terms of efficiency allowed to the tight end position. All signs point to Lamar Jackson being back, said he felt much better when he woke up Monday morning. Let's keep an eye on Hollywood Browns thigh injury. But Baltimore should have success here offensively as well, right? The, the Browns defense has just dropped off a cliff, and it's one of the more stunning things to me because I thought this was going to be one of the most improved units in the NFL, and they have the pieces and the players and the names that this should not be happening. And, you know, showing well against Tim Boyle and weather, like, doesn't do it for me, right? I, I completely removed that game from our data set just threw it out the freaking window (laughs) and all told the Browns defense has slipped to 24th in efficiency against a schedule of offenses in the bottom third of the league the run defense has been shredded whether it was the Patriots bullying them or or giving up a ridiculous explosive to Swift last week on a third and eight draw which is effectively telling them hey we're gonna punt here (laughs) just nutty right all told below average against the run the Browns are in terms of efficiency and now 25th in EPA per rush allowed. And and to your point at the top, right? Like this is such a tough game to predict because there's so much variance. You could argue that this game has the most variance of any week 12 game, right? Like both teams at their peak or maybe top seven type teams in the NFL, both are playing at a bottom 10 level right now. I mean, the Ravens have played one complete game in the last six weeks. And just looking at our core number here, Todd, 3.8 is is where we make this. It's only Tuesday, so still doing some digging here on this game. Did see some early money come in on the Browns at plus 4.5. But if this got to 3 and you saw Hollywood Brown up, there'd be some value on the Ravens. But again, like I, I don't really have a, a great feel on this game the guys that I've spoke to haven't really mentioned anything on it. So I, I have not seen anything to this point. But again, there's just you hit it perfectly at the top. It's like there's just so much variance here because all of a sudden you get one of these teams to play at that top seven level while the other one remains at the bottom 10 level. If the Browns do that, they're winning the game outright. If the Ravens do that, they're winning the game by double digits. So it, it, it does have a ton of variance from that perspective. 
There was one blog, and I can't remember who it was, so I apologize if any of the beat writers out there read it, and if it's completely erroneous, then I apologize as well, that speculated there was still a chance that Lamar Jackson might not even be available this coming Sunday, and that remains very much up in the air. I know the market doesn't suggest that now, hovering at three and a half, four, uh, and I found it relatively preposterous, but I guess this illness is a little bit more serious than they've let on. Maybe. I did not get that vibe yeah i mean i didn't get it either from a lot of stuff i mean it was one account that talked about you know tyler huntley yeah. and the potential for him to be out there but uh clearly the market That'd be doesn't, interesting but yeah clearly the market doesn't believe lamar is going to miss again because you're not talking about the ravens a four-point favor of the total in mid 40s um if that's no the case. no you're not no so. the browns would would be a favorite in that situation and and in all of the reports that i got was he felt substantially better when he woke up monday morning now you know the Ravens have been kind of mum and they haven't always been the most boy I hope I don't say anything transparent yes the transparent in some of these injuries right I mean (laughs) yeah the situation where uh, Lamar had a hip injury after the ridiculous flip into the back of the end zone and there was like illness (laughs) for Lamar Jackson illness and then all of a sudden, like, people are like, dude, like, that's a little too obvious. And they're like, no, 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 no we didn't say illness. And so, like, <laughs> you know, on Sunday, I had sent the note. Obviously, Lamar is a, a South Florida guy. So I'd sent the note to one of his guys. And it was like, hey, true 50-50. Like, we're going to see. Like, he's going to go out there and warm up. And so when you see a guy go out there and warm up and you see it truly be 50-50, it would be tough to fathom like in seven days that he's, he's not back out there, especially for a division game that's so impactful here. Yep, especially when you have a chance to put a little separation between yourself and the Browns, knowing a loss puts both of you at, well, at least Baltimore at 7-4 and four and would move Cleveland to 7-5. and five. So a lot still to be decided in one of the more competitive races as far as divisions are concerned. You do realize, Payne, when we've gone through five games in the college side, five games in the National Football League, the one game where our two favorite teams will be doing battle, it killed me not to do a full-scale breakdown between the Vikings and 49ers, right? Good game. Good game. Uh, it's unfortunate that only one of them... Oh, Jesus, I say this a fucking thing. Oh, end this a game's going to end it. Yeah, uh, <laughs> you open your mouth, the game's going to end in a fucking tie. So, uh, at this point, the way things are aligning, I think we'd rather have the Vikings win, is, I would, is my uh, vibe I, I, there. I would concur with that particular assessment. There's, there's going to be a little battle there in that game. Let's. Uh, we're not going to break it down, but you know, no. there, there's going to be early in the week. There was a group that that laid the two and a half with uh, San Francisco. It's going to trend towards three and a half, and I think there'll be a different vibe once that once that happens. So, be a little battle on that game. Should be interesting. Actually, one of the more uh, attractive slates of games, to be completely honest, on Sunday, that you have some marquee matchups early in the day and you have some nice showdowns late in the day. Unfortunately for me, I will not be able to watch most of them as I will be in transit back from my Thanksgiving destination. So I'm going to expect nothing but positive text updates when I drive through such cities like Wickenburg and Wiki up en route from Phoenix back to Vegas. When are you taking off? Uh, probably leave, what is it, Tuesday night? Well, it's uh, t- Wednesday morning out there in the East Coast, late Tuesday night it here. It is. Probably it late, is mor- late morning tomorrow. It's a lot of two-lane highway. That's a pain in the ass to try and navigate. So the goal will be to get down there for dinner Wednesday night, uh, sit down, talk to the folks, and then uh, be able to watch a little bit what of football you, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. What do, you, what do you do for Thanksgiving? Normal food, right? Normal Thanksgiving food? What do you mean normal food? What the hell do you think we are? Like an I, alien family I around here? I don't know. I don't know. What do you think we eat I matzo balls? You think we eat matzo ball soup for thanksgiving where are you going with this i i i was just asking i i didn't know no we what do, do you yes. do for what do you do for the night before uh you know we ever don't really do a whole heck of a lot this will be one of the first gotcha. thanksgiving where my uh, sister brother-in-law and young niece won't be making the trip so it'll be me the fiance gotcha. mom and well, dad I mean, so yeah. i'm not sure what's on the menu i'll be sure to send a picture to you though maybe maybe okay. pepper steak yes. i feel is what was thrown about as a potential option 
Okay, nice, so. nice. I mean, I know you are going to be marrying into an Italian family, so Passover dinner becomes a little bit better. But I just didn't <laughs> there, know what was no going mar- on. There's no, <laughs> there's no marinara sauce anywhere at the Passover Seder. You don't get to dip your matzah into marinara. That's not how it works. The, that's the Sebastian Maniscalco scene. Like, just, you know, give me some bread and some some oil. Tremendous. <laughs> a- absolutely tremendous, by the way. For anybody that hasn't seen that particular bit, uh, talking about when he goes to his first Passover dinner, I know we're way off on a tangent, uh, but encourage everybody to check that out. One of the best comedians that you turned me on to, absolutely priceless. Still want to see him live in person next time he comes through Vegas. Yeah, I think he's, he's there pretty frequently. All right. So, it is almost 1 a.m. here. Let's, so uh, it's let's that, it's get that to the time? important business. It's, it's that time it's that for time. you to tell us where we're putting... No, this is a we. This is a we thing. We're going to yeah. be French this week. All right. We, we. Uh, yes. <laughs> the, the win streak is on the line. It hangs in the balance. And as all of our listeners know, typically we like to wait as long as possible to try and gather the most information with you know college coming on Wednesdays, the NFL on Thursday. So a little bit unorthodox to come on Tuesday. But I think we've identified, or I shouldn't say think, I know we've identified an investable opportunity that's going to pay dividends for our listeners this weekend. So... It's the last game on the board, Saturday night. California and UCLA. The Bears have been quite generous to us over the years. Let's go with the Cal Bears plus the seven. And again, one of those like awkward situations where it's Thanksgiving week. I have no idea where this line is going to go. It's the last game on the board. The entire world just saw UCLA win by 30 last week. So... I don't know where this is going to go, but let's let's grab the seven. I may wait myself just to see what ultimately transpires here. But Cal is going to be the official best bet. We'll we'll call it at seven, but uh, wouldn't wouldn't scold anyone for potentially waiting to see if it were to to get a little bit higher come kickoff at 1030 as the bailout game. I think Cal's trending in the right direction, right? Obviously, you had the one data point against Arizona that you just completely throw out the window based upon the big C situation that impacted, you know, 30 to 40 players on the team. This is also their biggest rivalry game. And I know we talked off air a little bit about how Cal's players and coaches didn't think they got a fair shake at the game last year because they were also dealing with the big C that week. And so this just kind of lines up here. There's not a ton of value in the number, but the matchup is is, is pretty solid here. Cal's been a little bit better the last few weeks stopping the run. We know that's the bread and butter to UCLA. Anything you would like to add on to this? No, I think a lot of people, when you t- hear about it, I mean, you're always grown accustomed to Cal, Stanford, and that being the game. But you talk to some folks, they say this game has taken on much more added importance. And last week, of course, Cal could have sent out their B and C team to go out there and drub the addition of David Shaw. We can layer into it that Cal sits at four and six, so they'll need to win out to get bowl eligibility. Uh, with a veteran quarterback and Chase Garber, who's been a consummate leader, I think they'd love the opportunity to play that 13th game. Their game against USC rescheduled for next week, and it'll get the Trojans in a perfect spot, especially knowing that SC is just kind of playing out the stretch. So UCLA got their big rivalry win last weekend against SC. Would not shock me at all in a game where I don't think you build in any semblance of home field advantage in a holiday weekend at the Rose Bowl. Wouldn't be no. surprised if we see about twelve <laughs> or 13,000 fans in attendance, and it'll feel like a morgue from opening kickoff. Yep, com- completely agree there. So, so Cal plus the seven is the best bet. I will say this. We don't have an NFL bet at this point, but I would check back. And if we do have a second best bet in the NFL this week, it will be on the website. So you're going to crash. Go to you're gonna, you know, the last time you did this, we crashed the website, right? I, I did. Well, I'm, I'm not going to give a time. Last time I gave him an exact time and oof, <laughs> whew, that was not good. I, I so feel like we should tell everyone to sign point, up for the newsletter. Yes. At some point... Uh, there could be an NFL best bet that goes up. Obviously, this podcast will be atop of the website. It will say featured episode in yellow, and there will be a read more button that you would click. And that is where the best bet will be. I know there'll be a lot of questions as there has been in previous years when we've done this. So Cal is the best bet. If we have an NFL best bet, that is where it will be. Betttheboard.net, featured episode, click the read more button, 
and at the bottom of that page you will see the best bet i'm definitely not i'm definitely not checking my twitter feed on sunday morning because you know our mentions are going to fill up anything tied to absolutely uh, not yeah pain insider todd Furman, or bet the board but it'll be there uh and for those folks who are just tuning in to listen for the best bet we offered up all sorts of great promotions that are available to you in the coming days and weeks encourage all of you to take full advantage of the cash giveaways and everything else we want to do to show our appreciation for you all loyal listeners that have allowed us to even get to the point where we inch ever so close to the 400th episode do you have any thanksgiving advice that you want to dole out before uh we clear things out and we take a little bit of a holiday break a de facto bye week of sorts until we come back on monday night no no advice just enjoy time with the family have some cocktails drink safely car services ubers all that stuff if you're going out on the largest party evening of the year other than that i am going to enjoy this respite that's it all enjoy. right happy we'll thanksgiving all we'll see what we can do thanks to all of you our loyal listeners we appreciate everything you guys have done for us over the years I want you guys to be safe be smart enjoy your time with the family uh over this holiday weekend to kind of echo some of pain sentiments but most importantly Come Saturday evening in the wee hours of the morning on the East Coast and as midnight sets in out on the West Coast with a Cal ticket in hand, we'll see you 